And now on to our next speaker, Jesse Kate Schindler. Uh, she's the director of the Open Lunar Foundation, an organization working to develop a peaceful cooperative presence on the moon for the benefit of all life. Jesse Kate will speak to the challenges and progress in developing lunar colonies and the opportunity they bring for novel coordination and governance. Over to you, Jesse Kate. Thanks for having me today. Um, I'm uh, possibly a bit of the wild card speaker for the event. Uh, so I thought it would be fun to start with uh, sort of um, a bit of a bold anecdote for the moment, which is that right now, uh, literally, possibly as I'm speaking, there's a four ton rocket upper stage that's about to smash into the far side of the moon. And this is actually a totally unprecedented situation. The moon is a commons for all of humanity. And we don't actually know for sure whose upper stage it is from what rocket. First, we thought it was from SpaceX about a month ago, and now we think it's from China. But there's no real system of accountability for tracking deep space objects like this. And we also don't have good observational capabilities on the far side of the moon because it points away from us. So although we have a few broad treaties, there's really no precedent for the specific responsibilities associated with this kind of impact, literally. If it creates havoc for other missions that are currently operating, nobody knows what they'll do about it. And there's no rules for the future. If somebody wants to use that as a landing site, salvage some scrap metal, or cuts their spacesuit on an abandoned piece of space trash. Laws, land registries, situational awareness, these are all examples of public infrastructure and services in space or public goods that we don't have yet, but will eventually need. So why is there somebody talking to you about public goods in space? We're here talking about funding public goods and open source networks. And I would argue that open source networks are actually just one example of something much larger that's happening which is that there's an increasing prevalence of what I would call borderless public goods. This is a bit different from global commons or global public goods, because what we see is that there's this decoupling and a deterritorialization of public services and utilities from blockchains to public key cryptography. Borderless public goods don't all affect everyone in the way that climate or the oceans do, but they don't speak borders. Anyone, anywhere can benefit from them. So I think that open source, or let's say digital public goods, are a lens through which we can attempt to grapple with this shift. And as more and more of our social interactions and institutions are digitally intermediated, effective provision of digital public goods becomes increasingly relevant to a robust and functioning society. In that sense, this conversation is really on a kind of frontier of what's happening for society and humanity writ large. I love this image uh, of Rocket Man uh, floating in front of the earth. And speaking of frontiers, what might be less intuitive are the similarities between all of this and outer space. Outer space is also in this kind of borderless situation for reasons that might be less familiar to you, especially since there's a narrative of billionaires and first come first serve going to space for dry rides, etc. But the outer space treaty is the sort of predominant treaty that guides our activities in outer space. It was signed in 1967 and it sets up outer space as what's called an area beyond national jurisdiction. Article one of this very short treaty says that free access to all areas of celestial bodies is a must. And article two says that there shall be, quote, no national appropriation. So TLDR, that means no state sovereignty, at least not in the way that we're familiar with. Because no country has jurisdiction there, it means that we have to figure out how to do things without being able to rely on top-down declarative approaches to setting the rules. There's no one in charge, no one to ask permission to. 
And while there are plenty of places that we do have institutions and permission structures on the internet today, there are still folks like those in this community that are intentionally going to the pockets that aren't already colonized by legacy systems and trying to do things differently. Because we see that the world needs innovation in institutions, protocols for cooperation, and we want to use the landscapes out there that are available to us to try new approaches. What I want to argue and what I want to talk about today is that the moon as the first sort of place where a lot of this will play out is somewhere that we should also be looking to prototype novel experiments and to set future directions. Unlike the ISS, the moon is not an orchestrated ballet. The moon's gonna be a place where we have individual actors pursuing distinct interests and activities, emergent coalitions, and a lot more free choice. That also means more responsibility. Even more so, I wanna argue that we can cross-pollinate as well. The moon is a place where we can try new approaches that we couldn't try here on Earth which means that we can use it as a beachhead. Try things there and bring them back here, or we can use it as a place to leapfrog, to prototype things here, and then help set positive precedents for this fledgling foothold as we take early steps into the stars. Taking it back a step for a second here, is this real? So this year, 2022, we have an unprecedented number of missions going to the moon. There are seven landers and five orbiters. The majority of those landers are commercial. Each of the landers has payloads that have scientific engineering, communication payloads on them, We've got rovers on them. Uh, they've got some art on them. There's even some NFTs going, some government and many commercial and academic operators. The number of independent lunar operators that these missions will represent is many orders of magnitude greater than we've seen across all of history of space activity. Countries have started to adopt national legislation stating that resource utilization in situ on the moon is acceptable and more so that it can be bought and sold. No one knows exactly what that means yet one of the central roles of the state in modern times is to enforce property rights. So without a state, we don't know what property rights will look like exactly or how they'll be enforced. Uh, announcing where you will land, what frequencies you'll use, who gets precedent for what and why, what our obligations are to each other. All of this will involve setting precedents in important ways looking at new mechanisms to coordinate and incentivize behavior, good behavior, thinking about, uh, thinking freshly, I guess, about distributive justice, protocols for accountability, transparency, these are all central to efforts in space and to the distributed web. There are some specific experiments that we can do in a lunar context. One, of course, is property rights, as I was saying. We can buy and sell very small quantities of stuff on the lunar surface. Regolith is the word for lunar soil. Uh, and then we can use those purchases to ask, what does this even mean? And have public conversations and public dialogue about this. We can also do experiments with transparency. We can use incentive mechanisms to motivate operators to participate in transparency mechanisms who's doing what, where, and when. And there have actually been some interesting uh, efforts in this direction. Now, data sharing regimes. There's currently a norm of sharing access to scientific data, but no one's taking the lead on demonstrating what this means in practice. These might seem very small now, but as more and more folks go to the moon, in the coming years, if we don't have good systems and practices for these things, you can see how that lunar future could be dominated by private interests and competition. There's nothing wrong with either of those, but those alone don't get us a rich and thriving society. There's another part of the conversation here, and as I understand it, that's about sustainable funding. Everybody's talking about public goods. Now, I think we need to talk about publics, the publics themselves. <laughs> 
One of the things happening in the Web3 ecosystem right now is that money is flowing in somewhat unprecedented ways. Sometimes it feels like we're actually learning how to print money. I think this is exciting, but it doesn't guarantee sustainability in and of itself. Some public goods we can throw over the fence. Others require infrastructure and maintenance. For the latter especially, we need buy-in or stakeholdership. Who supports them? Who are the beneficiaries? Where do accountabilities lie? Effective, meaningful stakeholdership creates publics that become the seat of positive feedback loops, that is, incentive mechanisms for creation and stewardship of common and public infrastructure. So I think in space and on the web, these are the experiments that we need to lean into. The construction of a new generation of, let's call them opt-in publics, that are outside of traditional jurisdictions. How are we thinking about the construction of lunar publics in the context of the moon? We're looking very closely at lunar communications. Communications, navigation, and positioning, these are utilities that are needed by all missions. Uh, they're currently duplicated by all missions. It's a huge waste of mass, of cost, and of complexity. There's also, of course, an incredible history of standardization, open protocols, and interfaces for communication networks here on Earth. And this is a history that, for at least a time, led us to unprecedented openness and collaboration here on Earth. And I think this is something we want to see for the moon. Unfortunately, today, as we all know, it's becoming the shining example in a different way, a shining example of how much a system can go off the rails, becoming co-opted by capital, misinformation, conflict, post-truth. Post so how can space be a model for alternative futures? As a nonprofit, uh, I work for an organization that's called the Open Lunar Foundation. And we think that the introduction of lunar communication infrastructure as a public good could be an important opportunity to establish these publics. What this means is that providing some infrastructure, not as a commercial service, but in a way that kickstarts or bootstraps a sense of identity and investment in what's happening on the moon. Like any public, we think that this will need to involve at least some amount of engagement in decision-making and priority setting. But learning from experiments happening in uh, with DAOs and Web3, as well as last mile internet service provision here on Earth, we think there's also a number of interesting potential models that go much further than that, creating the possibility for community owned and operated infrastructure. Centering the idea of a public in this kind of endeavor, I think has a few benefits. Many of the services and infrastructure that we're talking about in both these communities are not actually public goods in a formal economic sense. They're club goods a lot of the time, or private goods or what have you. And each of these has their own long histories uh, of examples and scholarship, studying what good governance means, given the different underlying nature of these goods. So making that distinction is really important. And it's through the development of a public itself and the provision of a service for that public that they become a public benefit from the underlying good type. So it's about how we manage it as opposed to what type of good it is under the hood. Understanding who our publics are can also help with efficient provision. The idea that I've been talking about of borderless public goods is a really exciting one, but there's also the counter of that, which is borderless negative externalities, which are less awesome. One person's public benefit could be another person's public bad. So how do we have conversations about possible negative impact without knowing who we serve? Thirdly, naming who our public is allows us to construct feedback loops about whether they're having the intended effects. Working to address the needs of our stated publics builds buy-in and helps to create support for those endeavors. And finally, a healthy and thriving public also creates mechanisms for accountability, which is something that we all know from Ostrom's work is central to the effective management of any kind of commons. Tying it back together, 
I think that there's a ton of overlap in the need and mechanisms of experimentation between Web3 and outer space. And I think the moon is an exciting platform on which we can try new things. But I also think it's an opportunity to ensure that the moon isn't treated as a blank slate. We often talk about outer space as a blank slate, but that's an attitude that characterized problematic colonial logics of our past. And I think today what we need to do is to treat it as a Petri dish for better futures.